Welcome everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. We truly have a global audience with us today. My name's Brittany, the MOB Communications Director, um, and I'll go over a few housekeeping items before we get started today. Um, all participants will be muted throughout the presentation. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and comments can be placed in the chat box, um, also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, the Omega Collaborative, which is the MOB, Omega Resources for Resilience and the FAN Initiative, is honored to welcome Dr. Elijah Ochungo, Cecilia Wandiga, and a number of respondents from the Center for Science and Technology Innovations in Nairobi to discuss educating for the human predicament, proposing a circular bioeconomy. Our guests bring together ethics, environment, and economics in an innovative strategy for responding to the human predicament, the threats facing civilization. In search for alternative solutions to bring about more sustainable economies, the circular economy concept has become a popular model in many parts of the world. Dr. Ochungo and the team at the Center for Science and Technology Innovations are underlining African environmental ethics to develop biocircular economic models for change and assessing biocapacity in Africa. The center is offering global leadership in bringing science, economics, and ethics to the challenges of the future. It is more critical now than ever that we engage with, listen, learn, and react to the frameworks and powerful call to action this research brings. Today, we are joined by Dr. Elijah Ochungo, a climate change and adaptation practitioner he is the founder and principal of Climate Change and Sustainability Basics, a biocapacity measuring institute in Kenya. He is passionate about working closely with local communities to provide education and innovative solutions to address the emanating threats society is facing. Cecilia Wandiga, she is the executive director and trustee board member for the Center for Science and Technology Innovations. Ms. Wandiga promotes women's empowerment through her service as an advisory board member to Women in Sustainable Enterprise. She's an associate lecturer and sustainability coordinator for the University of Nairobi African Women's Studies Center, as well as the KEPSA Natural Resource Forum board representative for research and educational institutions. Ms. Wandiga has close to 20 years of experience as a management consultant for municipal governments, nonprofits, and private sector firms seeking to create positive impact through economic development and manufacturing activities. We will also be joined by a number of respondents who will respond to the presentation and speak to ideas for collaboration. Our relationship with Cecilia, Dr. Ochungo, and CSTI began from a mutual interest to collaborate around our similar goals. We are so excited today to welcome you uh, to our webinar and to be able to share more about this work going on and begin exploring deeper possibilities for collaboration. So welcome. By economy, which is meant to restore our ecosystems. One wonders, for example, Joseph Stills, the, the a great economist once said, we cannot satisfy the human needs. Continue next slide. So why is this so that our needs are so expansive? Our consideration is that it is pegged on our education system. As you sit before your professors, if you are a student, your mind is always on a flourishing curve. You are thinking of the city life, the motto life, the best lifestyle. And experts in education, and uh, this is a story from the American environment, have told us that we learn through the brain, our mind, our experience, and in school. And this actually forms the culture identity that we grow with in life. 
And once we form this culture, we take up culturally situated technology to make us live. And as we exit, we transfer the same to the future generation. We want to propose a shift. And to propose this, we need to understand our production model. Next slide. Our production model is such that a great economies like Kenneth Aron once told us that the economy is dependent on production factors, including the organizational assets, the natural assets, the intellectual capacity, the financial assets, and the technology. And in this, when put together, produce for us goods which we depend on and waste. The unfortunate thing is that we have been relying on a linear economy where we, we actually extract materials, produce, distribute to consumers, and throw away as waste. And the planet Earth has become a jackyard. And you can see in the hourglass that one time the ecosystem was very clear. Today, everybody is aware about the waste problem, be it plastics or general solid waste. We think there can be a solution through inclusive green growth. Next. This debate about the margins of a new growth model has been discussed extensively. And one notable expert is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We came up with the circulatory model discussing the biological and the technological circularity through the take, make, use, dispose model. And scholars have argued that this model needs to be enhanced through having an integrated model in which we have the egg, the egg phase where the yolk becomes our living environment and the outer part becomes the biophysical environment from which we extract uh, resources. In this way, there is nothing which goes to waste, if any, very little. And we believe this will cause restoration to the health of the environment. Next. At the global level, this model of circular bioeconomy is gaining currency. From the map on your screen, you can see the green parts are in countries that have uh, shifted to this model. Not, it is noteworthy that you can view from the screen that Africa is yet to fully join on this. So Africa has not used, utilized fully its biomass, resource, technology, and the integration of knowledge into this. Even in the scholarly world, in terms of publications, it was noted that from 2016, the interest in this area spiked, as you can see on the graph. Uh, in a general term, every country is trying to move to this direction. And here in Africa, I can say that we are still a, a, a minefield of policy and research. 
and it presents very good opportunity. That's why, in our next slide, that's why CSTI, CSB, and the University of Nairobi is thinking of coming up with seven points that will tweak our, the global educational model. And in our thinking, when we have point number one uh, on policy, the governance on resource extraction so should actually be mindful to the environment. And when this happens, everybody benefits, including the environment, as you can see in point two. And in point three, we will be considering the, the red list in terms of the species that are endangered. And as we do that, we join together to create community of practice, knowledge sharing, a position that even this evening's uh, conversation, this morning's conversation presents to us. And we are thinking that uh, point number five will promote green inclusive growth that is mindful to the economy, to the people and nature. And when you do that, you, we are doing ecological restoration in our development endeavors. And finally, we keep records of our environment in terms of environmental accounting. So we believe that this will help us. Next slide. Because we know if these are embedded in our educational curricula, the shift will now focus everybody to think of the welfare of the people, the environment, and the, and the economy. And we are saying the transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach that the Institute for Climate Change and Adaptation is using here in Nairobi University is the most ideal because as you can see on the image, on your screen, we, wherever we are, shall be focusing our attention on the welfare of our environment. And in this kind of training, the students will be taught system thinking, strategic planning, environmental evaluation, and being mindful to the environment as a whole. And we believe this will create a just world. And this should also teach uh, about adaptation. Uh, there's an interesting uh, figure on the screen about the bird with the green arrow pointing on the bird. This is a picture I took in my veranda uh, one week ago. Over time, we have noted that there is a bird which comes and rests at night on this lamp. So my quick understanding is that this bird has already adapted to the new environment. And I wish us humans could take coup from such uh, uh, animals and uh, also adapt to the changes that we see in our, in our environment. Finally, we think that if we have a paradigm shift in this kind of education, we shall, last slide, we shall be promoting inclusive green growth and not a growth that is creating inequality. We can see all over the world, we have a lot of social issues coming out of inequalities that has been brought about by the linear growth model. So we submit that we need a paradigm shift in our thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Um, we'll now shift to our respondents. Um, Cecilia, I believe you'll be kicking us off. Hi, everybody, and thank you. And thank you, uh, Alicia, for wonderful getting us started. And you are the, also the one who reached out and made this connection possible. So double thank you. Uh, the purpose of the response session is to give everybody a better understanding of the different ways in which different sectors and different individuals in Kenya are responding to biocapacity. Uh, from the perspective of CSTI, we're focused on circular bioeconomy and looking at the issue of culturally adaptive tools. And what that means is if we're going to look at quote unquote waste, uh, for example, I did a bit of research on uh, banana peels, which might seem as a waste until you find out that there's a lot of edible uses for banana peels. And in some cultures, it, uh, uh, many African cultures, uh, it's part of a staple food that uh, gets processed. Uh, because that's been discovered in Western science research, it's now being, banana peels are being used for biofortification. I was actually looking for waste banana peels as a, they make a really good um, uh, additive for construction materials. So this whole idea of what is quote unquote right and what is quote unquote wrong will vary and has to be locally discussed. And with that, uh, I'll let other members of the panel explain more. Thank you. Hello, I believe I'm next. Yes, Nation, go ahead. Okay, thank you, um, Nation Adero. And thank you, Dr. Akej, for the eye-opening presentation. Uh, seeing on the screen is the expanded sustainability debate from the traditional three-pillar approach to seven pillars. And for my background, which is in the area of geomatics, I would like to focus your attention on the place because we need shared visual evidence, which is part of social inclusion. If we can map out these predicaments, then we'll be able to communicate across the board uh, from uh, those who need informal ways of communicating to those who are at university level, for example, shared visual evidence will be inclusive. And then it will bridge this gap that I call spatial injustice. Because when you only have figures in your county without showing the geography of the metrics spread across so that you can see the inequalities by location, then you will not be inclusive in your approach. And nowadays, we are also talking of stakeholder capitalism, which is a uh, contrast to shareholder capitalism that was promoted by American economist Milton Friedman. Uh, so we are advocating for greater inclusion uh, through mapping technologies, bringing on board all stakeholders. And I believe through this we'll achieve the convergence we need even in the education sector we are talking of education 4.0 to resonate with the fourth industrial revolution. And here is where we need more inclusion and even engineering us to learn from biological system to be more green, hence subjects such as ecological engineering. And that convergence will be achieved uh, by following this expanded seven piece, which also rhyme with Dr. Cage's uh, seven piece. Uh, thank you and I believe we'll have greater insights for cross-fertilization of ideas to deliver on the green and sustainability agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nation. And next we have uh, Tobias.
Uh, I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes, we, we can hear you. Cecilia, am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. you. Are, <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a Thank presentation, you. but you know, I think uh, it's pretty much. Uh, yeah, I think I've got I've got some poor network over here, probably. <clears throat> the challenges of online working, but I'll continue. So, uh, basically, my my thinking, you know, embeds perfectly on what Alicia has just uh, presented, particularly on the significance of biodiversity as the core of you know uh, uh, you know the process of poverty alleviation and therefore nearly all humanity depends on a healthy biodiversity and therefore this always need to enhance that and ensure that it is well protected and secured but also to enhance the education and awareness uh, for the general pub public and the general population to really appreciate the fact that uh, biodiversity is the core of human survival and therefore <clears throat> if we undermine that that we are undermining the social and economic survival of our society. I believe that this project then is starting on a very important ground uh, by enhancing biodiversity, but also looking at, uh, particularly for me, how then climate change becomes a, a key component of this process. In so far as how climate change is now impacting on biodiversity, both in the present and the future projections really showing a very glim, uh, a, very, a very bleak future that calls for proper uh, understanding of the interactions between biodiversity and lama for infrastructure development, which then traverses some of these key yeah, important biodiversity areas. So coupled with climate change, then we are looking at a situation where species are going to go extinct and humanity is going to lose some of the valuable uh, you know, both plant uh, and, and, and mammal species, both important for food and nutrition and medicine, and therefore no, we lost a second. Yeah, we might have lost him for a second. Shall we jump to Dr. Sang and then we can come back? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, our next respondent is Dr. Catherine Sang um, from the University of Nairobi Institute for Climate Change and Adaptation. She's a postdoctoral research fellow for the Development Corridors Partnership, and she'll be responding on the need for a better understanding of water basin hydrological, uh, hydrological flows and capacity for water reuse. Catherine, are you with us? Yes, good morning, good evening. Yeah, so I'll be, first I would like to thank uh, Dr. Akech for a very nice uh, presentation. And this conversation actually has, is really timely, especially in the water resource sector where I'm really interested in. Um, this is because uh, in Kenya, we are faced with water scarcity. And this is not because we don't have adequate uh, water resources, but it is because of, of poor management. And I think this uh, uh, circular bioeconomy concept, if it can be applied in the water sector, we can improve on our water supply and also we can have sustainable water resource for, for, for the current generation and for the future. So uh, in Kenya, we are faced with the water shortages and uh, given also that uh, we, are, we have the risk that is posed by climate change, which has really altered the weather patterns in our country and also, may, uh, also globally. Uh, so with this concept, we can apply uh, the uh, water reuse where water is not just let to go to the sea. We make sure that 
we we uh, we reuse our water. For example, the industrial and uh, the municipal wastewater could be used for irrigating uh, maybe um, the lawns and uh, maybe um, uh, irrigating uh, agricultural uh, farms and so on. So I'm um, really uh, this is a very interesting um, concept that can really help in boosting our water resources. We see uh, to, uh, water scarcity is, uh, is something that uh, should be addressed from both sides of uh, water balance. That is from the side of supply and also demand. So uh, this water reuse will uh, address the demand side of uh, Water, where water will be, uh, water will be used for several uh, in for, for several use purposes before it is disposed, and also if we can engage in uh, water harvesting so that uh, we boost also on the side of uh, supply so that we have more water. So uh, I think uh, this uh, basically is on the side of reusing the water. And for us to be able to apply this, we have to understand uh, the ideological flows by doing what we call integrated water resource management, where we manage water, uh, as I said earlier, on both sides. We are looking at both the supply and the demand. So um, this concept is really appreciated, and I think it will go a long way in, a, uh, uh, for, uh, in achieving sustainable water resources in our country and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I believe Tobias, you're back with us. We'll jump back to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly now. Yep, we can hear you. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I think my computer wasn't uh, that that great. So uh, maybe just to wrap up, what I was saying is, uh, you know, the critical linkage between biodiversity and uh, and and uh, and social and economic well-being, and how we can then embrace uh, what uh, Dr. Alicia called the systems thinking. You know, we we are one together, and uh, we act as a unit. Therefore, if one of them is compromised, then it might lead to some consequences. So. That's quite critical. And then, you know, issues of socio-ecological thinking as well, where we look at, you know, all these aspects of uh, humanity as well as their ecosystems or their environment as part and parcel of their well-being, uh, landscape scale, you know, ways of looking at things. And they have, I mean, looking at, uh, at, at, uh, at, at, at life as well. And so I think, uh, you know, the issues that are being raised uh, through this forum, therefore find a place. And I'm glad that, uh, uh, Alicia really emphasized the fact that uh, University of Nairobi as a learning institution really needs to be central in the dissemination or building capacity, both receiving and then disseminating and building capacity towards such kind of thinking. And so I believe it's an opportune moment, uh, but also uh, an opportunity for the forum to really build on the structures and also on the uh, you know, facilities available through the university uh, educational system to enhance some of these. So really trying to emphasize the interdependence between different components of nature and, human, and, and people in a way that enhances their survival, but also ensuring that we are able to ameliorate some of the impacts of, of a, uh, you know, environmental impacts such as climate change, uh, over exploitation of these resources in a way that can enhance uh, social and economic sustainability. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to getting engaged in the process further. Thank you so much, Tobias. Um, a quick, we have a couple of more respondents. And um, before we, we continue, uh, just a reminder, if you have questions as you're listening, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A at the bottom. And we will have time for a few questions uh, in a few minutes. Our next respondent is Stella. Um, Stella, go ahead, and if you're able to join us by video, um, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, my name is Stella Matema Simiu. I'm a biodiversity and climate change um, practitioner. They may not call it expert, but practitioner. And I've been involved in um, the developing the red list species 
in Kenya and basically in the whole of East African region, but also working with the Ministry of Environment and other stakeholders in um, just coming up with um, a documentation of the biodiversity of, in Kenya and um, in East Africa. I also worked uh, for a while with the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, um, looking at just the trends and status of biodiversity. And one of the main indicators of biodiversity loss is red list as species, which I was alluded to by uh, the presentation by uh, uh, our colleague Elisha. And one of the biggest challenges with red lists is that uh, there are um, a biological concept from the scientific world. And so the language in which uh, they're communicated is, is basically a technical scientific language. But when you're dealing with uh, issues of bioeconomy, um, looking at uh, green growth, and you're looking at you know, all these aspects of natural capital, you begin to realize that you're beginning to talk across to economists, you're talking across to policymakers, you're talking across to other you know, stakeholders that don't necessarily um, are comfortable with you know, um, technical and, and, and you know, scientific language. They speak a slightly different language. They talk in terms of um, you know, figures. And so it is important for us to be able to speak the language they also speak, to be able to communicate effectively. If you're going to get traction in terms of getting support and input and investment from their sectors. And so one of the things that has come up you know, more recently and um, even that is of relevance is the whole issue of natural capital accounting and, and trying to, you know, to bring in, um, there's a mention of environmental economics, but going beyond that and just trying to ask ourselves a question, what is really the cost of biodiversity loss? Um, and, and, and beyond that, also trying to understand, therefore, what is the value when we try to invest in sustainable use and try to enhance sustainability? What is it that you are gaining in the economy? What are the facts and what are the figures? And so that is where collaboration and, and uh, is very useful and, and, and mainstreaming accounting and practices for natural capital valuation uh, becomes very, very important. There's a whole movement worldwide um, on natural capital um, you know, valuation. And, and more even beyond that now, there is a whole move to try even to bring into agriculture the whole issue of um, valuing biodiversity in agriculture. We recognize that in agriculture, for example, agriculture is one of the main drivers of biodiversity loss and yet agriculture is the main beneficiary from biodiversity and ecosystem services. So to be able to have um, good balance and to enhance sustainability, it is important to recognize how much we are losing and how much we are gaining. And so um, enhancing um, natural capital accounting, natural capital valuation is a very, very powerful tool in being able to you know, move forward with the um, bioeconomic concept because we can speak a language that other sectors also understand and really are able to get policy support because policymakers understand one language and uh, yeah, we need to speak the languages that different sectors speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. Um, joining us next is Professor Shem Wandiga. Uh, he is a CSTI managing trustee and will make remarks um, uh, uh, and invite us on collaboration on community practices. Professor Shem. Thank you very much, Brittany. Thank you, everybody, participants and ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My comments are going to be a story of a community in my country called Kikuyus, who says that this art belongs to our children. And therefore we must do everything possible to leave it to them as much as possible. The second uh, thing which I want to say is that the Western economy and even the developing economies are geared towards money, the profit, the value, which Stella has already alluded to. However, how much does it cost to restore a lost species or an endangered species, critically endangered species like the rhino in my country? There are only 
three white rhinos which are left. Two of them cannot bear, the two female ones and cannot bear. And they are hoping that another one or other black rhinos will have a species because they have a gene bank stored somewhere in Germany. What is the cost of restoring that rhino to the bioeconomy? What will we gain by having a white rhino or a mutant of a white rhino restored in the economy? Let me go a little slower down and say, how much does it cost to restore a lost plant species? How do we handle that one? How do we, <clears throat> do we have the technology to restore a lost plant species? Certainly, these are issues that we have not answered, and there are many more. This is a new concept which we are starting. It will bring controversies, it will bring issues, and this is where collaboration in research is needed and is useful. I hope we can continue to collaborate to unravel some of these issues. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Our final respondent is um, John Kayubi. Uh, John is a principal consultant with Built Environmental Surveyors and in Infrastructure Consultancy Group. Um, he'll be responding with opportunities for collaboration on edge certified green buildings and locally manufactured green building products. John? Oh, we might have lost John again. <laughs> Okay, um, if he jumps back on, we'll have him uh, jump back in. At this time, um, Cecilia and, and Elijah, I invite you um, to conclude the respondent section and with the invitation to collaborate. Alicia, go, go ahead and then I'll follow you. Thank you very much. First, I will start by Thanking everyone for joining in this debate. At CCSB, our focus is to raise awareness on climate change and sustainability, and in detail, help measure biocapacity of our local ecosystems. So our call to collaborate will be in the area of knowledge sharing and disseminating the same to the local communities and societies. This is our call, thank you. Thank you and uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions which is very exciting uh, about circular bioeconomy and the extent to which the, there is any sort of scientific research preceding uh, industrial transformation on uh, the reuse of materials and especially with concerns about uh, toxic effects of uh, chemicals that seep into different things, materials, the air, everything else. So what, what I can say is that we're starting and, and this is the whole objective of this meeting is to start making people aware that this topic is of being discussed. Um, Dad, Tobias, uh, uh, the, uh, Alicia, you've seen um, Catherine, Nation, these are uh, faces and, and scientists who are actually doing the kind of research that would lead to uh, more in-depth and, and life cycle analysis. I'm seeing that. So they're your entry points in here in Kenya and we can always then expand into others. And uh, Pradeep, I saw uh, questions about India. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of collaboration be with between Kenya and India for decades now. So uh, that can continue through this forum. 
So what I invite you to do is just um, uh, uh, keep in touch, uh, of Brittany and, and Joan are collecting the emails and uh, keep this discussion going. Let's not, like we do, we get very interested during a webinar and then we drop off for a while. Uh, let's just figure out maybe some core themes or some core areas that we would like collaboration to happen on and keep the discussion going after the session. And hopefully John is back or is he? Um, there he yeah. is. So let me let him talk. Okay. Thanks, Cecilia. John will jump to you um, before addressing some of the other questions. All right, uh, thank you, Brittany. So uh, I think I'd like to share my screen if you allow me to. Go ahead. Okay, so there we go. Are you able to see my screen? Let me have it in full screen mode. Right. Great, fantastic. Uh, great. So uh, my name is uh, John Kabir, um, the founder and chief technical consultant for PC Group, which is essentially a uh, professional services. Um, consultancy offering uh, solutions around in um, uh, climate change, circular economy and green building, both at uh, the building scale, as well as the um, urban scale that's at neighborhood level or city level. So for this particular uh, presentation, uh, I just wanted uh, to share with you something which I did out of my own um, initiative, not as a consultant, but as a resident of uh, this particular area and also as the chairman of uh, the residential association of this particular estate. So what we did is that we wanted to share with the residents that let's take some steps in managing materials that flow in our estate more responsibly. And by doing so, the best way to go about it was to go the circular economy, or use the circular economy model which will be able to make a lot of sense, especially for our natural ecosystems. That is making sure that the materials go back into reuse or find some other usefulness along the value chain and make sure that they continue this circular loop and finding value at all times. So in order to get started with it, uh, the most important thing was of course, to get the residents buy-in because it was a challenge or we are talking about a, a residential area of about um, 5,000 housing units, um, which translates to around uh, 30,000 emotions to manage. So um, we, we had to start from somewhere. So the best place to start was, was to come up with a, with a plan for the estate and that's the environmental plan for the, uh, for the estate. So we came up with a new asset environmental plan 2020 to 2025. And uh, in it, we had some specific targets. And as you can see there, some of the specific targets were to increase uh, um, tree cover by about 150%. We had made a plan to recycle as much as 90% of our waste and recycle it or apply circular economy principles in the process to make sure that there is higher value of what materials that flow through our, through our estate. So we also set targets to improve the air quality in the estate and that included uh, identifying non-point pollutants and of course uh, getting a baseline of exactly how our air quality is. Um, we also decided to see how we can be able to uh, switch from our, uh, our usual energy, I mean, to switch to solar uh, street lighting because uh, we're currently using uh, the current uh, model of energy, which is very expensive and it increases the service charge for the, for the area uh, residents. So we felt like it's important that we switch to 100% solar. But all these are part of our bigger plans, which are for five years and we are one year down this particular road. So once we shared this with the residents, the residents were able to get into the buy-in and say that, yes, I think there is a clear vision and we can buy into this clear vision to be able to take that circular economy journey. So in the process, as you can see, we uh, started off with uh, one of our climate action goal, which was tree planting. Uh, this is just one of the snapshots in, uh, in the area within the estate where trees were planted. So you can see from 20, 
18, that's how the specific area looked like as far as uh, uh, tree cover is concerned. And then as you can see in 2021, that's the number of trees we were able to plant there. So we made it a point that it doesn't become too crowded, but planting is actually reasonable, but not just planting for the sake of planting as many trees as possible, but it all has to be planted. So what, you can, what we've done so far is we've planted about 800 trees with a survival rate of 78%. So for the air quality monitors, as uh, has been shared uh, through this um, webinar, is that we had to do this through collaboration. And for this particular program, the air quality monitoring, we partnered with uh, the Kenya Green Building Society. The Kenya Green Building Society was the Kenyan implementer of the World Green Building Council's uh, 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 plant ascensor campaign, which was anchored under the um, the uh, better places for people. And uh, what happened is that we chose uh, to participate in this because since the COVID-19 pandemic came into force, many people were actually working from home. So if so many people are actually working from home, what's the air quality of people who actually live around those particular areas? So we wanted to set an example and say, let's plant um, air quality monitors so that we can be able to know and know how to improve our, our air quality. So when it came to our management of materials, cause uh, we've now switched our language, we no longer call it waste, we actually call it materials. And when you look at this uh, presentation, that's the last time I actually referred to materials as waste because we want to do away with our terminology because waste is because we don't recover a lot out of our material. So if that's the case, then let's choose that language and start nicely. So as mentioned, the estate is, uh, has about 5,000 housing units. It's a mixed development with uh, 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 apartments and uh, uh, maisonettes and, all, and it's all under 220 acres in, um, in the Makasi area, part of Nairobi. And what we had found out or what we had just sort of like got as estimates was that we were generating like about 21,000 ton, 21, tons of waste a year. And in Kenya, the current rates are about 60% uh, of that, of course, is organic. And then you have plastics at around 12%. So when you started the whole circular economy journey, we felt like we needed to start with the low hanging fruits or materials which have quick um, exchange, uh, which have, I mean, quick exchange. That means they can easily be uh, put back into the circular loop and uh, plastics apparently happen to be one of them. And secondly, there were also certain initiatives which were being launched to the country. For example, for this particular case, we partnered with the New Plastics Economy Kenya, which is basically a, a partnership which had come together to see that they recycle as much plastics as possible in Kenya. So one of the things that they had to do is they had to collaborate with the source of these plastics. And one of the places where majority of these plastic materials really circulates it's in residential areas so this was a controlled residential area where you could easily be able to get uh, the materials so we partnered with them and by partnering with this uh, new plastic economy they were to provide uh, the necessary infrastructure which will help to accelerate um, uh, the uh, segregation of plastic at source within this particular estate something which was actually very successful because we were able to employ numerous, um, numer numerous strategies for doing that. One of the strategies, of course, was to uh, create sort of like a buzz around circularity. And that was um, create a launch where some of our partners were able to distribute uh, uh, the uh, segregation infrastructure. As you can see in this particular image, uh, there was a company called uh, Petco, which is an extended producer responsibility organization. Uh, and uh, they're responsible for uh, segregating of uh, plastics. So what they do in their case is that they provide the infrastructure to willing partners. So in this case, we were already a willing partner because there was a plan in place to actually take that particular direction. So the partnership was formed. Uh, Petco is part of the new plastics economy. So there was the launch. And as you can see, after the launch, uh, the neighborhood, people got to know about what was going on. And by getting to know what was going on, we started to now segregate these materials. Apparently, what we discovered is that people are also excited about this whole program and uh, they also started to improve 
on the existing infrastructure. So as you can see in this particular image, of course, we created a communication around um, what we needed to do. And uh, part of that communication was largely through uh, Facebook because the estate have their dedicated Facebook page. And that's where most of the residents are able to access this information. So by doing so, we picked out the most common uh, platform, which was Facebook. And through that, more people were, were educated. Uh, awareness was actually created because we needed their active engagement in this particular process because without it, it will really fail because because we're encouraging somebody to actually be able to segregate materials from source. We are encouraging people to abandon their behavior of just dumping all materials just the way they want and adopt a very new um, model way of doing things, which is also very foreign to their parents and their grandparents. So how do you tell them that what your grandparents and parents were doing was actually wrong? It wasn't wrong, but the circumstances at the time were different. So we were able to do so. And by doing so, we saw some behavioral change. Uh, most of the existing waste management infrastructure had actually been abused and materials were being thrown away any, any, anyhow. So the residents took it upon themselves to invest in improving on their infrastructure to be able to segregate and collect as much material without uh, any contamination so that they can be able to uh, get it at a higher value. And some of those initiatives was the revamping or rather renovation of these waste houses. And as you can see in this particular image, the courts, because the estate is divided into courts, started to renovate them. They invested money into making sure that they are now cleaner. There were awareness sessions which were actually carried on and people were able to uh, participate. As you can see in this particular image, these are just your usual residents who are saying enough is enough. We want to manage our materials in a more uh, circular way. And they created some sort of like governance structure which can be able to get this sustainability of circularity going on. And it, not, and it won't be just a one-stop event, but it will be continuous and it becomes uh, part of the norm. So uh, active citizen engagements were carried out. Leaders were sensitive to exactly what is uh, circularity. And there we started to see more and more residents actually taking place or engaging in these particular kind of uh, activities. So as you can see, we also track uh, information or data on what is actually being uh, done in this particular neighborhood. As you can see in this image right here, you can actually see um, that PET and non-PET plastics are actually being collected and we are able to capture uh, the data. So these are bio as of February of uh, this year, we had collected like around 1,872 tons of PET plastics. And on the picture on your right, you can actually see the gunny bags, which we normally use to collect this PET. It's normally done on a monthly basis. And it's created a lot of excitement uh, around uh, the residents. And they now want to re recycle more and more. So conversations around other material streams like um, organic waste have really picked up. And at the moment, uh, the estate is actually working on uh, creating um, uh, composts for uh, recovering uh, organic waste. That is part of it. And part of it, we are actually to collaborate with uh, uh, a local, uh, with a company which was actually started by uh, some young university students back then from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They came up with a new idea. Their company is called uh, Sanergy. They actually recover uh, organic waste and convert it into um, animal feed as well as um, fertilizer. And it's actually doing a great work. Initially, it was just a pilot, but now it's become a full-fledged company. So the estate has actually signed a memorandum of understanding with them. And so they will be collecting uh, these materials uh, from time to time, and then they'll be able to uh, put them back into the loop. So I think this has created um, a, a lot of excitement you. and awareness okay. that um, materials are actually have another value if you actually think more about it. So uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for this opportunity. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, John. Um, we are just about at time. We have time for one more question. Um, Nation, I believe you'll be speaking to the question uh, in the chat about what plans do you have for bringing circular economy to African governments and industrialists? 
Um, and just before we jump there, a number of the questions were answered through the Q and A. Um, so those uh, we'll, we'll be able to save those and share out that as well. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take a look already. Nation to you for our last question. Okay, thank you for that question. And uh, through systems thinking, we believe in uh, high leverage points. So the high leverage intervention point is uh, government, the central government. And in Kenya, we have developed a green public procurement framework because the government is a key player when it comes to procurement. And the gap that has been there is how do you decide on the greenness core of a product? And this is where universities, researchers, and scholars came together and came up with a formula that gave environmental criteria a good weight of 30%. Gross country review revealed that environmental criteria have been getting as low as 10%. But here in Kenya, we are now recommending to the government 30%, and then technical and economic criteria 40%, and finally 30% to, to social and human rights criteria when we are procuring products that are truly green and environmentally friendly. So I would like to say that we must ensure that our voices are heard in the policy making circles, and we must appeal to government so that this can be implemented in policy and legislation to be truly transformative for the whole country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to extend just a, a huge thank you to all of our presenters and respondents today. Um, this was incredibly um, useful and helpful, insightful, and valuable. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about the work that you're doing locally, but also how our ideas um, can be shared more globally. Um, lots of ideas and potential for collaboration that I'm really looking forward to. There have been a number of questions in the Q&A, so we'll make sure to post those with the responses that were provided as well. Um, as well as some additional resources that the presenter shared with the mob today. So we'll be able to share those as well with um, the recording of the webinar when it's on our website um, in about a week or two time. So again, thank you. Um, I hope everyone at home is joining me. Um, and a huge thank you and round of applause for our presenters today. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and have a good evening and a good day. You too. <laughs>